All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, something here. There we go. All right. How do I sound, everybody? Welcome uh, to my stream today. Uh, every once in a while, uh, for the upcoming issues of my newsletter, Astrolabe, I like to go back in time and check out some of the, you know, retro games that I've missed or, or old favorites that I haven't played for a long time. I'll ask my Twitter followers to make suggestions. Um, this is all for a column called Late to the Party, um, which uh, comes out in every issue of Astrolabe, which you can find at aiden.substack.com. It also comes with a ton of other goodies covering stuff like science fiction, fantasy, books, writing, just general kind of geekdom uh, topics. Uh, today, I'm playing something old that's also something new it's a uh, it's a fan rom hack called chrono trigger crimson echoes um it was created uh a number of years ago by a group of fans who wanted to make an experience that tied together the narratives from chrono trigger and chrono cross uh as anyone who's played both of them knows uh there are ties between the two games they're technically set in the same world uh but they are um obtuse i guess is the word for it um they are they're complex and in my opinion and in the opinion of, of many other players chrono cross sort of sort of missed the point of chrono trigger and the way that it connects the two narratives is um feels off chrono trigger crimson echoes uh attempts to take chrono trigger attempts to take chrono cross and create a narrative uh about what happens in between and how we get from chrono trigger to chrono cross and what everything means for the overall um series narrative um i've never played it before uh despite being obviously a, a big chrono trigger fan as anyone knows who's who's read my work um but i've heard very good things about it the thing about crimson echoes is it was never officially released uh, the team behind it, who we're about to learn a little bit about in this intro, uh, poured a lot of effort and time and energy into it before, just as the, the project was about to be completed, I think it's 98% complete in this form, uh, they received a cease and desist order from Square Enix and could never officially release it. But uh, as we all know, uh, nothing goes away on the internet and uh, copies of the ROM hack eventually made their way onto uh to rom hack sites um so we can play it um it's not done not completely i don't know if we're going to see any signs of that during this playthrough or not uh but 98 percent is you know is nearly there and my understanding is you can play through the whole game no problems um enjoy the entire experience um you know without any real issues uh today we're going to check out you know, about the first 45 minutes or so while I'm uh, while I'm on my lunch break, and uh, then I'm going to write about it in the next issue, issue of Astrolabe, which will probably come out next week. Uh, it's a free subscription. You can sign up again at aiden.substack.com. You can see a, uh, a link URL right there um, on the right-hand side of the screen. And so uh, now we're going to get uh, we're going to get started here. This boots up, um, or as soon as you boot up the game, you get this little introduction here, uh, where the developers, the team behind it introduces themselves the project and also uh states that you know this isn't officially officially affiliated with chrono trigger or square enix um or anything like that first time you play this as soon as you make a save file you'll never see this little intro again um so we'll go through here uh it just repeats basically what i just said um and each of the characters here uh Zeality, jp and chrono 99 i think um are major members of the development team. Um, so they're saying, you know, it's not canon, uh, but they did try to use canon for both of the games uh, in interesting ways to tie them together. Uh, Chrono Trigger is a lot to uh, live up to, but, uh, you know, the effort is appreciated, uh, however, uh, however they sort of executed on this. And just so we're all, uh, just so we're all clear, Oops. where's my copy? Got a copy, my very own copy right here. So uh, I feel like that, uh, you know, that covers me almost my legal basis uh, for playing a wrong hack. So I lost my screen. All right, so um, let's get going.
So you can see that they were um, promoting Chrono Trigger DS as a copy to pick up, um, where like to support the franchise. So that kind of gives you an idea of when this came out. I don't remember the exact date. Um, I think Chrono Chrono Trigger DS came out in 2008, if I'm uh, if I'm correct. Um, so that was the first time since the PlayStation re-release that you could um, you could actually go out and buy a commercial copy of Chrono Trigger that wasn't the Super Nintendo version, which was like crazy expensive, or the PlayStation version, which was crazy bad. Uh, since then, you know, we've seen Chrono Trigger across everything, um, starting with you know, um, virtual console on the Wii and then throughout, you know, various different platforms. Uh, so it's readily available now. Uh, the Steam version, which was a mess when it was released, is now actually a, is a pretty good solution, pretty good option for playing the game. So um, right off the bat, we're, you know, in the lean square, um, talking about big meeting with poor. Uh, anyone who's played Chrono Cross might remember that poor is sort of the big bad, um, aggressive, military, uh, military heavy country that sort of, um, comes in and, and decimates, um, Chrono and Marl's kingdom, I think, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and so the game's starting off with a first big meeting between Marl's dad, the king, and, uh, Poor. And of course, Poor has a, uh, a large presence in Chrono Cross as one of the uh, kind of invading forces uh, in the archipelago. So I try to talk through a lot of these um, <clears throat> streams, uh, but I'm going to try to read a little bit more this time around because I think the story connections are one of the most important and interesting parts uh, to this project. Uh, so bear with me if, uh, if there's a little bit of silence here and there as I read, uh, but hopefully that'll give you time to catch up on the story alongside uh, me. Yeah, so what Marl's saying, I, I think it's one of the really interesting things about um, epic fantasy is we have these big, huge adventures where the world changes and, you know, new magic arises or there's time travel uh, or the big, you know, interstellar uh, parasite is defeated. Um, Chrono Trigger is super interesting because Chrono and Marl and Luca, they travel from 1000 AD uh, they live in 1000 AD, but the, the threat, the existential threat, doesn't actually impact their era. Um, they could live out their lives in, like, essentially what seems like a utopia. There's peace times. Uh, Marl, in particular, is highly privileged. Luca obviously lives, um, you know, a life where she's really supported by her family in terms of um, being able to pursue science. Uh, Chrono, you know, does his thing at his mom's house. But uh, their existence, their way of life isn't threatened. It doesn't happen. Uh, that doesn't happen until a thousand years in the future, 999 years in the future. And so what's really interesting is that they um, put themselves out there. They, you know, very selflessly chase down a future that uh, a threat from the future that they'd never actually experience in person. And so Marl here is thinking about how, you know, like they've gone through everything that changed the world. They're back in their time, but nothing's changed. They haven't changed anything anything in 1000 AD. Uh, I think this is now 1005 AD or something like that. Um, and so it's a whole new challenge for them. Um, and I think that's going to be an interesting concept for a game. Uh, right off the bat, we're seeing some dialogue from Chrono, which is, uh, which is weird. Uh, <laughs> weird to me, but uh, Chrono was silent, obviously, in the original Chrono Trigger, except outside of one ending, I think. Um, but, you know, they might be going for kind of a more complex narrative that might need Chrono uh, more engaged in, uh, in that. Well, we all know Chrono's going to sleep in. I, uh, I have no doubts that he's going to sleep in tomorrow. Um, this is a nice callback to the original game uh, that opens exactly in, in this manner. Um, which is kind of fun. And here we have Marl waking up Chrono, who has, of course, slept in. Very typical of, of Marl to have to come and wake Chrono up. He, um, his role in the original game is, is interesting because he's he's the hero he's uh he 
kind of follows that that typical arc of the hero and yet we never get any internalized dialogue we don't know what drives him we don't know how he actually brings all the other um heroes from the game together um and so like you know how has he changed what is he and where is he now in his life um five years later when he's still just you know sleeping in living at his mom's house you know just, just relaxing um but so you know, here we go. It is 1005 AD, but now we have uh, Chrono's Diary, which maybe it'll give us a little bit of insight into um, into some of these questions that I'm asking. Uh, seems like he's not too big on meetings, which I do not blame him for. So I like how there's lots of callbacks to the original opening. Um, Chrono's mom greeting him um, at the bottom of the stairs before he leaves. Like that, that kind of stuff is is always nice. Um, just as a way to kind of ease you in and, and show respect for the original game. Um, all right, so here we are on the world map. It looks all, you know, very similar to what, uh, what we saw at the, in the original Chrono Trigger, but here we are in Lean Square, which is obviously, um, very different. So this is it without the Millennial Fair setup. Um, and we can see it's sort of like more of a, um, day-to-day -day use. Um... <laughs> okay, bit of a uh, referential humor as well, um, which you often get, I find, in um, you know fan translations or ROM hacks or fan sequels. Um, all right, I can buy some lemonade for 5G. Sure, let's do it. Restore my HP and MP. All right. So, Food Emporium. So, a uh, little shop. I can buy, you know, the same stuff I could uh, in the original game. Uh, you'll notice actually um, that the UI has been changed a little bit. The game's called Crimson Echoes, and we kind of have that brought through in this this crimson kind of reddish um, UI that uh, that propagates throughout the game. Um, window color. We can also go and and use you know all the classics uh, from the original game, um, except the default one maybe. Uh, this one was always my favorite. Uh, this is what Chrono Trigger looks like to me. I, I like green, and I also just feel like it has a kind of classic, uh, but still unique uh, look to it. Uh, for this playthrough, I'm going to stick with this uh, fancy red one that we've got here. I'm going to bump up battle speed um, nice and high, message speed nice and high. And uh, yeah, so Chrono Trigger, uh, or sorry, Chrono, uh, back to using, um, you know, just basic weapons. I don't know what ha happened to Rainbow or the Prism Armor, but uh, you can't exactly make a game that, uh, you know, piggybacks off of the ultra-powerful uh, characters uh, that we all played with in the original. So, um, so it's, it's fun being able to explore um, an area from the original game that's in, like, a very different different um, format. Uh, we'll take a little peek around here before heading off uh, to the castle. Um, do I want to try his pickles for one gold? Um, go with no way, man. Okay. Uh, so it's much more open, uh, in this area. And one thing that I'm kind of feeling is it seems like the whole, f like, lean square feels empty without the fairground um in it uh lots of open space like this one of the things i think it works remarkably well about chrono trigger uh is that its level design is super tight um there's just there's no wasted space and so when you remove some of those elements even if they are just like set dressing um you kind of notice how integral that is to kind of creating a, a dense realistic world and in, in a super nintendo rpg uh, here we are. This is where you would do the prehistoric dancing in the first game, and we've got some statues um, of our six heroes from um, from Chrono Trigger, minus uh, Magus, of course. Uh, so that's what's interesting there is that there is obviously like a commonly accepted uh, narrative that Chrono and Marl and Luca and the rest of them, you know, save time uh, if they're being sort of revered in that way. So that that's an interesting. Um, little world building edition and no um teleporter all right so let's carry on with the story here um 
one thing I'm actually curious about to see is um, if we head to Luca's house. Uh, so we see her mom, Lara, uh, who, of course, um, is not using a wheelchair. Um, it so it looks like we've probably followed through um, to, like, the good ending in Chrono Trigger in terms of where you've gone through all of the side quests, of one of which involves Luca traveling back in time to prevent the accident that um, injured her mom. And uh, Tabin is still, uh, he's still doing his thing, grumbling and, uh, and inventing. Okay. All right. So here we go. Um, a new addition to the world map is this cathedral. Um, that's obviously in the same place as the one from 600 AD. Um, but inside we can see it's some um, quite different. Um, service has ended. And so we can kind of see maybe who they're, uh, you know, if it's a cathedral, it's worshipping um, something, and religion wasn't a big part of Chrono Trigger originally, despite there being a, a prominent cathedral. So I'm sort of curious to see uh, see what we're looking at here. Um, huh. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, we have... You know, he seems to be praying to what looks like a, um, you know, an image in a, a stained glass window. I can't remember if that's found in Chrono Trigger or not. Um, the colored hair is interesting. Um, the outfit also looks similar to how we see uh, Shala in Chrono Cross. And so that uh, that could be some, you know, maybe it's something new, uh, or maybe it's not, and I'm just uh, speculating. Yeah, there's a cave in, so obviously we're gonna get to go there eventually. Um, but for now, let's carry on. Um, it's fun seeing how the world has kind of changed and evolved in those five years um, since the first game. Um, one of the things I think is most interesting in epic fantasy is watching the world not just go through kind of catastrophic change because of, you know, a world ending threat or war or whatever, but also just technological advancement, pro like social progress, uh, those sorts of things. Um, you know, there are some epic fantasy book series that do it really well. Tad Williams, Memory, Sorrow and Thorn and its a uh, sequel trilogy, which he's currently working on, are really interesting in that way. Terry Brooks' Shannara um, throws a lot of technological progress uh, into the, his world building over the course of his uh, Shannara series, which I also really like. And so here we are at the castle. Um, there's a meeting going on. The meeting will take place in the basement of the tower, which is on your right. My right? Or Chrono's right. I'm gonna go with my right. Um, okay, here we go. So the envoys are almost here. I'm with Luca and uh, and Marl. Um, so the king has obviously taken uh, taken to Marl's friends, uh, Chrono and, and Luca, which is which is fun. Okay. Yeah, still weird hearing Chrono talk. Um, so I'm curious. I'm, I'm very curious and interested to see where they take that and, and whether that kind of um, really plays into the story. I, I like the king kind of humoring. Uh, I mean, humoring the kids, but at the same time, you know, they, they did solve an existential, like, interstellar uh Crises, so uh, you know, I think they probably can be trusted. Though I think Chrono should probably have his uh, rainbow sword back, uh, if anything. Okay, so the poor army is arriving. <laughs> yeah, just say let's go over and over. Yeah, I, uh, I can't like in Chrono Trigger the the other people respond like as though Chrono speaks sometimes. So I guess he's not uh, not as simple as the game makes him out to be but uh but i i could uh i could definitely see that if chronos only lines or you know marl drives the ship luca comes up with plans and and chrono just sort of like you know leroy jenkins style um just lets go and just you know runs recklessly forward <laughs> i 
<laughs> uh, good little bit of humor there. Like the modders were probably working with, um, you know, limited assets. They're trying to reuse things from the other game. And, um, and so, you know, pointing out that it's kind of funny that both the guards have showed, or both the emissaries have showed up um, in full, full armor. Um, unless there's something else going on. Only one of them is speaking. Uh, so things are starting to feel a little fishy now. So one of the things that I think is really interesting here from just a narrative and storytelling perspective uh, that feels different than Chrono Trigger is that there's narrative going on around the heroes. Whereas the majority of what happens in Chrono Trigger, uh, when there's narrative, when there's storytelling is happening directly with somebody from the party. They're speaking to Chrono and his friends or, um, you know, the hero party is actually driving forward um the dialogue whereas here we're seeing something that's maybe more um similar to you know like narrative in an epic fantasy novel where chrono and them are sort of our um you know our eye into what's happening in a in a more broad sense okay so talking about steam power coming into the world which is um which is interesting um the ferry that you can ride from area to area in 1000 AD um, does look like it uses some sort of steam power that was present in the original game. Um, it has, you know, those big wheels uh, that are turned by steam. Um, and so, I, you know, like, it's interesting to see, you know, look at the original games and say, okay, what level of, like, sign, like technology are they at? You see a steam uh, steamboat and kind of extrapolate out, outward from there that the world would probably continue uh, down that path. Um, all right. So the castle, the royals own all the patents and machine shops. Uh, we know that poor has, you know, ambitions of becoming a military state, um, but uh, Guardia owning all of the patents on technology would probably, you know, obviously get in the way of that. Uh, it also shows a fairly uh, robust legal system already at this point, uh, which is obviously you know, a subplot in Chrono Trigger. Okay, so there being... Uh, the sun, they're talking about the sunstone and they're getting fairly pedantic um, here about what happened in the original game. Uh, Marl's remembering correctly that they were given the sunstone um, by the mayor who of course they went and kind of changed his behavior by giving his ancestors some, some jerky. Um, and now they're trying to assert that, that, that Marl uh, stole it. Um, which obviously isn't true. Ingress is talking, or no, Ingress is that guy. The other uh, poor soldier is talking now, um, and doesn't sound uh, doesn't sound too well. All right. Uh, yeah, they're, I would say that they're strange. At least one of them is strange, and the other one is obviously trying to keep uh, keep the other one under under wraps. So what's going on with that one poor soldier is, uh, is curious. Does anyone have questions um, so far, or any thoughts on like Chrono Trigger versus Chrono Cross, and and how you might see a story kind of falling um, in between them that connects uh, the two narratives? <laughs> I'm not sure Princess Nadia is ever going to be, uh, you know, diplomatic to the the king's standards. Feels appropriate for the chancellor to just completely miss the uh, the meeting there. Okay, so they were expecting the chancellor. Okay, so poor is coming in here, uh, not not negotiating in good faith, uh, 
but looking to actually, you know, violently force enforce um, their conditions. So what um, the one poor soldier that just ran away is reminding of, reminding me of is Grobeck, the um, cyborg character from Chrono Cross, um, who I believe was developed by poor scientists. I can't, uh, I can't quite remember how he, uh, how he was created, uh, but that's a vibe that I'm getting from uh, from this character who we're uh, chasing after. Inhuman speed, the way he speaks, um, all of those sorts of things. Okay, so something was just stolen from us by uh, by this guy. And now we have a completely new scene, which is cool. This is kind of using, um, it looks similar to the 65 million BC um, setting, but also some of the Donardo Mountains from 600 BC, but we, you know, with a, a palette uh, change, uh, which is bringing it sort of more into that 1000 AD, brightly saturated, nice, beautiful colors uh, feel. So he's dropped whatever it was that Luca was working on. Uh, we don't exactly know what that is, however. It looks like the time egg from the original game. Okay, so it is a time egg, and, and Luca has been trying to, uh, to recreate it. Um, so she's made a prototype. Um, so one of the big questions after the end of Chrono Trigger, if you've uh, finished the um main like story and got the like quote unquote good ending is you know like what is the state of time travel after lavos has been defeated are the gates still stable uh does the epoch exist have you crashed it into um lavos or not um it's like how does all of that work and so i like the idea that like right after um yeah okay so is this mod set after chrono trigger yes it is it's set five years after chrono trigger um, from what I can tell, just based on a few little things, it's set five years after the good ending of Chrono Trigger. So you've defeated Lavos, you've done all the side events, uh, all the side quests, um, and now um, Chrono and Marl and Luca are just back living life in, in 1000 AD. Um, so it's it's a direct sequel to Chrono Trigger, and it uh, it looks to tie its Chrono Trigger into Chrono Cross sort of more um, more strongly, um, fill in a lot of the gaps that occur between Chrono Trigger and then Chrono Cross. So here we've got a malfunctioning time egg, which I imagine is going to. Uh, to be an inciting incident in terms of setting up the story that's to come. I don't know why Luca is just carrying around her prototype time egg, um, but uh, but hey, uh, she's she's smart. Um, okay, so she's been working with Melkire and starting to understand gate mechanics, um, which is cool. It's cool to see kind of yeah, classic Luca. Absolutely, um, uh, it's cool to see you know. The magic in Chrono Trigger approach from a scientific perspective. Um, Chrono Trigger is so interesting because it mixes magic and technology um, in, in its world building, but also in its skill system and like throughout its whole um, entirety, science and magic sort of coexist. Um, and so I love the idea of Luca continuing to pursue um, all of that from, a you know, the idea that she could replicate this from a scientific perspective. We're getting sucked into a big accidental gate. Probably uh, not a great way to spend your day, but uh, a great way to kick off a, a story. Okay, here we go. So we've got a gray gate. We've seen red gates. Uh, we've seen blue gates. Uh, we've never seen uh, gray, gray gates. So uh, let's see where this takes us. Hmm. 
<clears throat> Kino being, uh, Kino being Kino. Yeah, one of the big things uh, that stood out to me when I was playing Chrono Cross uh, a couple of months ago is like the whole Masamune storyline is just weird. It doesn't match up at all with what happens in Chrono Trigger. Um, it changes form. It's this weird and evil malevolent entity, um, which is utterly unlike how it's presented or how it behaves, how Masa and Moon um behave in the game um and i hope this game kind of touches on that and here we see frog i'm um, talking about how he can't steal the sword back up in the cave has to go to the castle and so um we're gonna hopefully throughout the course of the game you see how um the sword goes from like you know this this force of good to this force of of evil oh yeah the time travel uh gate graphics like the first time around was like out of this world like there uh, with the super nintendo i would say there are you know like a few very um defined touchstone moments for me the the big one being stepping outside a link's house in a link to the past and seeing the rain blew my mind uh the gate travel the mode 7 gate travel um in chrono triggers is absolutely like one of those top five moments of like okay like this is this is it this is next level um when you you know hold it up to something like final fantasy 4 or even final fantasy 6 which was released not long after um yeah f-zero is another great example i mean all of the all of the mode 7 stuff on the super nintendo was impressive um from the you know world maps to uh f-zero um and mario kart um and it still seems great to me today um just that ability to manipulate like graphics in that manner on um on a system that mostly relied on on pixel art um sprite art is really impressive i i never was and i i i never was impressed with like the the actual 3d tech stuff like Star Fox, uh stunt race fx none of that really appealed to me all that much i didn't find it very impressive and i didn't find it impressive when the playstation came out either um i feel like the tech 3d tech just wasn't really couldn't match like mature 2d tech uh, but the way that f uh, mode 7 kind of introduced some of that um kind of graphical flair to super nintendo games i think was a good good happy medium um of course, one of the big Mode 7 uh, events in Chrono Trigger was the race against Johnny, which um, I, I do think is one of the one of the few flaws in that game. It uh, it doesn't um, it doesn't actually need to exist. And um, I was watching a speed run of Chrono Trigger um, a little while ago, and it turns out it's actually faster to walk across um, that those ruins than it is to do the race itself and so it's in there just to be cool and um and it, it's not fun you just you know there's there's not a lot of there's not a lot to it uh it looked cool at the time but uh it's it's a part i can uh, i can skip uh pretty happily nowadays on replays um, so here we are, we're kind of getting into a point where we're catching up with some of the other characters. Uh, we're seeing where they've, um, where they've gone uh, since the end of the last game. Um, not big on this. Frog Glenn has kind of lost his voice from the first game. Like, I hate that formal crap. Feels off to me. Um not just using you know like kind of an anachronistic word like crap but also just like him speaking to a fellow soldier that way like frog was very tight and reserved and like that part of him was just ingrained in everything he did and i can't you know i can't see him speaking to a fellow soldier that way Okay, okay. So, fortunately, the Time Egg um, has sent us right uh, to the future where Robo's working. So that worked out well. 
Uh, maybe Luca already had some sort of coordinates in there. Um, but it could have been a lot worse, like being deposited into the vastness of space. Um, so here we go. Okay, interesting. So Belfazar is there uh, with Robo. Uh, we don't know where they are. We don't technically know when they are, though that's obviously the future. Um, the thing with time travel is, you know, the story in the present when we start the game is five years after the end of Chrono Trigger. But is that does that mean that the future is five years later? Is it, you know, 2305 AD when we go to the future? We don't know yet. Uh, so now we've got like a title card, which is uh, which is fun. Um, a good little intro, a little more cinematic than, you know, like what we were often seeing on Super Nintendo at that time. Um, yeah, not not big on that frog dialogue. That, that feels like a big misread on the character. Um, even if you look at the Chrono Trigger remake, re-release on, on the Nintendo DS, which retranslated all the frog's dialogue and took him out of that like fake, bad, faux medieval... English, um, he was still very like you know honor bound and very concise and very well spoken and respectful. So uh, that felt like a big misread of his character to me. So it looks like Magus here is, um, you know, that's one of the Earthbound ones. So we're probably back in 12,000 BC. Um, when? I'm not sure yet. Somehow I always expected Magus to have uh, not be warm. I don't know why. I know he's human, but uh, he just looks so much like a vampire. One of my favorite, um, while we're on this... Uh, Naming screen, you can see there's new dialogue or uh, new profile pictures, which is kind of fun. Uh, one of my very favorite like Chrono Trigger bits of trivia is in Chrono Cross, we find out that um, all the enlightened ones in 12,000 BC, so everybody that lives in Zeal, are, are, they're all blonde, uh, but it becomes trendy um, to dye your hair. So in Chrono Cross, we meet Shala, who's Kid, uh, the character Kid, uh, and she's blonde. Uh, so Magus you know, the dark wizard, uh, edgelord, uh, is actually blonde and somehow somewhere finds, um, the means and the time, uh, to, to dye his hair and maintain his, uh, his purple dyed hair, which I just think is, is adorable. Um, okay. Okay, so this is cool. Like, Zeal's crashed, and now the Earthbound ones are sort of, like, using the the findings and, and all the, you know, in all the destruction, they're finding technology and items and stuff from Zeal, and that's, you know, maybe what kind of spurs on um, the next advancement in kind of human civilization. Okay, so this is kind of cool. So, like, the game's kind of kicked off. We've had the title card. Uh, so this is, like, you know, the, the beginning, the proper beginning. And, um, you know, we're kicking things off with um, with Magus as a main character, which is which is cool. Um, this is a nice little bit of, like, map design right here. We can see, you know, like, the world itself is kind of beginning to reform. And um, there's an ice bridge, which was not present in... Um, in the original Chrono Trigger, so that's kind of a, you know, a fun way of, of seeing how the game has changed. Um, I'm supposed to go see the, the chief, but I found this other little village that I want to check out a little bit. Um, so Sargon's house. Whoa. Okay. Uh, Sargon does not want me to use his healing square. Uh, he is not being kind. So right off the bat, what I think is nice is that um, when Magus first woke up, the young Earthbound uh, child said something along the lines of like, hey, don't worry, don't, you don't need to thank us. We all need to work together to survive. Whereas Sargon is um, 
you know, being very xenophobic and very unwelcoming um, as he's built his little house here and is living on his own um, and refusing to kind of help um, anyone else. Um, and that kind of shows the divide between the earthbound uh, people and the the enlightened ones that uh, now live down on the ground level. Um, I guess it's being, you know, over the top and and uh, dark. That seems in character. But he's got a heart. Look at that. Okay, so, you know, Magus has kind of scared Sargon into um, allowing not only him to use the healing square, but also the, the villagers. And so, you know, Magus is very focused on um, finding his sister, but maybe he's also learned something along the way, right? Uh, about community and about um, healing. Okay, so I'm running close to the end of the stream. Um, I don't even think we've got into a battle yet. So um, let's continue on a little bit, see what sort of um, what sort of story uh, we're going to get over the next 10 minutes or so. Okay, so it's been a year since Zeal crashed. So that gives us a, you know, a bit of a timeline for what we're looking at. Um, so some time has passed in each of the, the different eras, but different amounts of time also. So nice little bits of cause and effect. Um, I get a gift for, you know, confronting Sargon, uh, which is nice. One of the things in Chrono, um, the original Chrono Trigger is that like sometimes it doesn't actually have as much cause and effect um, as I expected it would or as I expect it would as a time travel game. Um, there's always opportunity to just go back and, and follow through on things um, and change things, but it's always along a you know, a linear path. And I like the idea that there's little, um, little areas where you can, you know, create cause and effect. Um, and obviously this is within one time zone, but you could see how, um, you could, you know, convince Sargon to do something. And then later in a different time zone that, you know, has some sort of small effect rather than the effects always being these sweeping big, um, story based moments. And Delton is back. So we know from Chrono Cross that Delton was somehow involved. Um, I think, um, or maybe I'm just misremembering based on what I've read about this game. But in any case, everybody's favorite uh, incompetent um, enlightened one is uh, is back, and he's as charming as ever. Okay, so Sargon is, I guess, you know, a fairly main character uh, for this early part of the game. I've already met him. Um, Dalton's looking for him. Um, So the Elder recognized Magus as Janus, whereas Delton still just thinks of him as the Prophet. Uh, so there's a bit of a, you know, a knowledge gap there, which is kind of kind of interesting. Okay, so Shala is considered a traitor. Um, So one of the things the game is just skating by is that like, you know, at this point, Magus um, would have, you know, all his skills, all his, um, all his spells um, and a lot of power um, and Dalton probably wouldn't be able to keep up with them. But um, for the purposes of this game, they've obviously scaled everyone back and reset the power level a little bit. Uh, looks like he has some new uh, skills, which is interesting. Uh, one of Magus's challenges in the original game is he wasn't very good at like, you know, direct one, like uh, one to one damage. He was good at kind of splash and area of effect damage. Um, but if you're starting off the game at level five with Magus, um, you need to kind of switch things up a little bit for him. So he has Shadow Bolt, which looks like a, a lightning attack versus one enemy, a uh, Steel, um, which didn't exist in the original game either outside of Isla's skills, uh, Omni Shield, which, um, Cast Protect and, and, and Barrier, I think they're called in the original game. And then Dark Bomb, which um, which is one of his spells from the original game, um, but it takes 400 skill points to use. And so it's probably going to take a long time before that ever gets uh, unlocked. 
Uh, and he's got a new scythe called Erebos and a new suit of armor. I'm not seeing any description of them, which is too bad. Um, and I can't see them in there, so. We're gonna go down to Sargon's house, see what uh, see what Dalton is up to there. Okay, so Sargon's still here. Uh, Dalton, has he been there? Okay, so Dalton was just looking for information from Sargon. I am finding some of the dialogue just overall is not that tight. Um, you know, Magus is is a jerk, but him going around calling people idiots also does it also feels out of character. Like I think that there's like you know a tightness and like an innate sort of like um, violence to him, but he's he kind of threatens more. Uh, through action and through potential than like than screaming bad words at people and calling them names um it's you know it's hard to create a new nar type of narrative out of characters that um or a more complex narrative say out of characters that existed in in relatively simple narrative forms in the first game um so I'll, you know i'll give uh, benefit of the doubt here as, as we continue on um but we'll see. We'll see how things go. Uh, so we have to go to Beast Forest uh, to find Dalton. This is where Sargon found the um, artifacts, Zeal artifacts. And so Dalton is obviously looking for them. Um, and here we have our first look at battles in Crimson Echoes. So we're quite, quite a ways into the game. This is 50 minutes into the stream. Um, and we're just getting into our first battle. Uh, the Beast and the Red Beast, they were bosses in the original game. Um, and so I don't know if this is kind of... If they're trying to, like, narratively solve that power level issue by saying, like, you know, in the first game you're fighting imps first thing off the bat, and now Magus is so strong even at level one that he's fighting, you know, the Red Beasts, which were bosses in the first game. Um, kind of an interesting way of, of dealing with, like, you know, the, the issue with, like, how do you level up your characters? Um, when they already start the game really strong. I uh, finished the Final Fantasy VII Remake a few months ago, and that's another game where, you know, I ended the game at level 50 or whatever, and, you know, I'm a third, not even a, not even a third of the way through the, the original game's story. And so when we get, you know, the second part of the remake, you know, what are they going to do there? Do they you know, just roll everybody back to level one with no skills or leveled up materia and just not mention it? Or do they kind of allow you to bring your characters over and figure out how level scaling works in a way that like an MMO, MMO RPG does it, that you just keep getting stronger and the enemies just keep getting stronger? Um, or do they do something else where, you know, narratively they um, they can reset the power level in some way? I don't have an answer for which I think is the best way to go. I think every game probably needs its own solution. Got Red Beast and Blue Beast. Um, well, that's Lightning. I didn't actually see what... Okay. So Shadow Bolt is kind of fun. It's like, so they, like, the new... The new techs actually have new graphics associated with them, which is cool. Um, which goes to show, like, you know, how much attention they put into this mod. Um, that they're creating not necessarily new assets, say, but remixing the, the existing assets in interesting ways um, to make the game feel more sort of uh, rich. Okay, I am very low. On health so one thing so yeah so dark bomb took 400 uh, skill points we're down to 386 so I've gathered 14 um, which kind of gives us an idea maybe of how long it'll take to, to unlock dark bomb and and I'm gonna say that's probably quite a while my guess too is that we're probably at a play it, like it's probably going to be the type of game where we're 
gonna bounce back and forth between different narratives. I kind of get that sense. Um, you know, Chrono and, and company are in the future now with Robo and and maybe we're gonna get back to them before Magus actually meets up with uh, with those three. I'd say the game right off the bat feels a little more challenging than the original. Um, having a single party member um, facing off against like multiple uh, monsters like this means I'm my HP is getting whittled down quite quickly. Um, whereas in Chrono Trigger, like you do just have Chrono for a bit at the beginning of the game, but it's not long into the actual adventure that you get. Um, that you get Luca back, um, at which point you have kind of more, um, more, um, more options and, and battles go by a little faster. Um, and these enemies just feel a little stronger too. Oh, I got, I have my first spammer in chat, everybody. Uh, this is, this is exciting. Now I have to figure out how to uh, end them. There we go. All right, so save spot. It's the first save spot I found. So we're gonna create a save spot. Um, 50 hours in, we're level five. Um, this also means that that beginning of the game, I got that little message about the, uh, the game itself. Um, and now uh, I'd no longer get that because I have my first save. I could always save on the world map, of course, but uh, this save spot also suggests to me that we are about to get to, if not um, a boss battle, at least a scene where um, something happens. Okay, so Dalton is going after uh, immortality, which seems fully in character for him. Um, probably fair. Dalton, if I remember correctly, the last place we see Dalton is him getting sucked into one of the golem's portals, right? So um, I guess it didn't take him too far. Uh, okay, so um, so Dalton is, is bu okay, buggering off to some ruins to the far north, uh, and now we have our first boss in the game, the golem boss. So we'll... Uh, We'll see how this goes. He's got Iron Ball, which uh, cuts my HP in half, and then also some, you know, relatively strong um, attacks. So I am going to have to watch my HP here. Um, Chrono Trigger isn't an easy game. Uh, it's not a particularly hard game either, uh, but I would say that this game is probably harder off the bat than uh, than Chrono Trigger was. Um, and I've died, which marks, I would say, uh, a fairly good uh, endpoint for this stream. I've reached in the end of my lunch break. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I really want to um, actually give Chrono Trigger Crimson Echoes a serious playthrough um i just finished chrono cross a little while ago and chrono trigger earlier this year and um i really love it and the mod this like this sequel rom hack seems super ambitious i like a lot of what i've seen even if i feel like some of the writing and the dialogue doesn't exactly hit, uh hit true to me um, I still think that there's enough there that um, I could uh, I could really enjoy it, especially you know like if they kind of do some interesting things with the overall uh, narrative and the ties to Chrono Cross and everything. So, um, just gonna mute uh, the sound. No, I'm not. Uh, anyway, thanks everybody. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, this was Chrono Trigger Crimson Echoes. Uh, I played it today as part of the Late to the Party column that I do for my newsletter, Astrolabe, uh, which goes out every few weeks. Uh, totally free to sign up at aiden.substack.com. You can see it right, right up there uh, underneath the box art. Um, I appreciate you joining me. Thanks so much. 
Um, I'll be sending out the next issue probably early next week so you can read more of my impressions uh, on Chrono Trigger Crimson Echoes. And then I'll be back uh, in the new year with my next stream. And uh, for that one, you can take part by following me on Twitter, which is twitter.com slash a dribble of ink, A-D-R-I-B-B-L-E-O-F-I-N-K, a dribble of ink. Um, and that's where I usually do polls, uh, to pick my, uh, my games for these streams. Uh, so if you join me over there, you'll be able to vote on the next one. Um, and I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much for joining me today. All right. Have a great day. Bye.